KPIs. Uh, wanted to let everybody know that we will, in fact, uh, as if you just got the same pop-up message that I did, that this is being recorded. Um, but it is a pleasure to have you join us for KPI's 2021 uh, candidate briefing. This is the third one that we've done here in the last month or so. We did in-person events in Johnson County and Sedgwick County uh, in late uh, June, and now we're broadcasting it out, as it were, to the rest of the state. Um, for those people who weren't able to join us in person for one reason or, or another. My name is James Franco. I'm the president of Kansas Policy Institute, and it is always a pleasure uh, to be able to talk about the work that KPI does um, with people around the state who are interested not just in politics and the uh, kerfuffles that we see on the front page of news media or on Fox News or anywhere else, but actually the policy outcomes uh, that face our state um, and what we're all working for, which is trying to make Kansas a better place to live and work and, and raise a family. We do these candidate briefings every year. Uh, it's just a question of whether or not those are focused on state uh, legislative races and whatnot in the even numbered years uh, or local government and board of education races in the odd numbered years, which is what we do here today. So again, thank you very, very much for joining us. We're just gonna plow right through each of the presentations. Um, when we get to Q and A uh, at the end of every individual presentation, we're not going to call people onto the stage. I'm not going to turn on your audio. Uh, use the Q and A or the chat function in order to be able to communicate with the speaker and ask them questions. Um, in that chat function right now, you are going to get three things. Um, you're going to get an email address for me. You're going to get an email address for Dave Trobert, and then you're going to get the case submission page. Uh, for Sam McRoberts, who is our litigator, and he's going to be batting lead off. We will do uh, introductions here in just a half a second. But to get in touch with any of us, that's going to be the best way to do it. Um, as questions uh, percolate after this event. So the person who is hiding behind the Kansas Policy Institute logo um, and is posting the email addresses and case submission pages, Hannah Nelson. She's a great member of our team and her Beth Wasco um, and Ellen Hathaway are the ones that make all of these events work for us and we wouldn't be able to do it with them without them, excuse me. Um, I'm sure each of you have those people in your lives and for KPI it is those three uh, people as well as other people on our staff that make that happen. So again, check in that chat function right now in order to get uh, contact information. The last person on that contact list is gonna be Sam McRoberts. And he is going to lead us off talking about where we have been over the last 15 months with the Kansas Emergency Management Act, as well as uh, changes to it and some of our local health orders and things of that nature. Sam is the litigation director with KPI's litigation outfit, the Kansas Justice Institute. Um, his job is to stand up for the rights of Kansans uh, where they are infringed upon by local and state governments in the great state of Kansas. His first case incidentally, that he won was on uh, raw milk advertising and the government prohibiting raw milk producers from being able to talk about their lawful product off their farm. Uh, but since then, he's been very involved with uh, litigation and strongly worded letters related to some of the different actions taken by governments during the pandemic. And he's going to talk to us about the importance of Senate Bill 40 and uh, some of the different goings on related to that uh, over the last 15 months and maybe looking ahead a little bit. So again, we will field questions through the Q&A and the chat functions that should be right down here on the bottom of your screen uh, when it gets time for that. So Sam, uh, take it away. Thanks, James. SB 40, I'm gonna try to answer basically two questions tonight, or at least talk about two different things. SB 40, what is it and why is it important? So to understand kind of what it is and why it's important, we got to think back to about March of 2020. Um, one day we're all sitting around living our lives. And then the next day we start hearing about shutdown orders. We heard about barbershops that were being told they must close. Uh, we had instances where local health officers were prohibiting car parades. We had shutdowns for movie theaters. We had occupancy limits for shopping malls um, and for churches. And when 
all of those shutdown orders or all of those closure orders came out, it became really clear immediately that it was very difficult to try to challenge those kinds of orders. There was no easily identifiable vehicle to kind of push back against the government. And so you, you might have heard of instances where maybe you thought one shutdown order didn't really make sense. You thought maybe it was arbitrary or unreasonable, uh, but you just, you didn't have this opportunity to actually say anything about it because for example, you have an unelected politically unaccountable health officer who's just imposing this restriction on a business operation or imposing a mask mandate, something along those lines. And you would have instances where a barbershop might be closed, but the beauty salon might be open. Um, and it was really strange because in one county where there might be COVID cases, you wouldn't have a shutdown order. And then other counties, maybe there weren't any COVID cases and you would have a shutdown order. It just, it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, so you got to think back to March of 2020, like I said. Now, now let's fast forward a little bit to May of 2020, and you would have a, a health officer impose a health order like what happened in Lynn County, Kansas, where they were ordering businesses to compile lists of patrons uh, and, and other people who would come in, <clears throat> excuse me. And then according to the Lynn County Health officer, that information must be disclosed to the health officer upon request. And again, there was no real way to kind of push back or fight back against these local health orders, except for what Kansas Justice Institute did. And we filed a federal lawsuit on behalf of uh, Linda Jo Hissel and Jackie Taylor. And, and really what we did was we said, hey, wait a sec, uh, Mr. Health Officer, you can't do this. You've got to follow the Fourth Amendment. You got to, you basically have to follow the law. So but for things like a federal lawsuit, what, what were you supposed to do? What was your recourse against government shutdowns? And one of the things we saw again in the beginning was this essential versus non-essential business. But when we're talking about business owners, I mean, no matter what the business is to them, it's essential because you have the right to earn an honest living. So, that really kind of started the basis for thinking through what's the procedure, what's the mechanism, what's the vehicle to push back against these health orders. And then in October of 2020, Kansas Justice Institute filed a federal lawsuit against the Douglas County local health officer and on behalf of Peach Model and the Sandbar. If you've never been in Sandbar, you gotta go. It's great, uh, you gotta talk to Peach, she's an awesome person. But what we were arguing in our sandbar case was you have to have procedural due process. You have to have a meaningful hearing at a meaningful time in a meaningful place when a health officer imposes a business restriction. And that was one of our, in my opinion, one of our strongest arguments was being able to have this hearing, this due process hearing, this procedural due process hearing. And again, what is procedural due process? Well, let's think of it in really broad strokes. If the government's gonna bulldoze your house, for example, do you have the right to have a hearing? Uh, maybe that hearing's not gonna work out in your favor, but at least you get to put a pause on things. You get to get in front of a neutral party to say whether or not the government can do these types of things. So in the middle of our sandbar litigation, the legislature uh, put together SB 40, and, and now we're getting to kind of what is it? What is SB 40? Well, it allows people to have their day in court. Again, it, it allows people to actually push back against government health orders or any type of really government restriction during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's, it's, not, it's not that novel to have a hearing in front of a neutral party. It's been around. The Supreme Court has talked about having your day in court. They've talked about the importance of procedural due process, even in emergencies. Uh, it, it, this is not something that is completely new, but what is new is that the Kansas legislature created this statutory right to a due process hearing. And drilling down a little bit into some of the details, SB 40 applied to school boards, 
and community and technical colleges. It could apply to governor's executive orders. It could apply to local health officers orders. And that's really the one where I kind of want to dig in uh, for the moment. So let's think through kind of what we have all heard about it. And let's use the sandbar, for example. So the Douglas County health officer restricted the sandbar's hours of operations. And so at some point, the health officer said, well, in order to ostensibly stem the COVID tide, we're going to reduce bar hours from 2 a.m. to midnight. And then at some point, it was 11 p.m. And then it went to 10 p.m. And I think at one point, it went to 9 p.m. Well, for the sandbar and for Peach, that really impacted their ability to earn an honest living. It impacted their business operations. And so what SB 40 does is it allows a person to file in state court. It allows them to have a hearing in front of a, a state district court judge. And at that hearing, and this is what's so remarkable at SB 40, it puts the onus on the government to prove that what they were doing made sense, that what they were doing was justifiable. So for example, if there was a reduction in bar hours, then the government would have the burden of coming in and saying, judge, this is why we are imposing a restriction on bar hours. And the hearing was to occur within 72 hours. So if you file on a Monday, get your hearing within 72 hours, the government comes in, tries to establish what they were doing is reasonable. And if they couldn't, and then the judge was to make a decision within seven days of the hearing. And what the government was supposed to prove was that their order was narrowly tailored and used the least restrictive means in accomplishing their goals. And so it couldn't be too broad. It couldn't be arbitrary. It had to be very specific and there had to be a good solid reason for imposing, for example, a bar curfew. And if the judge didn't decide within seven days, then the person who filed their petition in state court would have been granted the relief for which they sought, or basically what they were asking for, they were gonna get it. So if a bar owner, for example, said, hey, we have we have put in uh, plexiglass, we've done all these COVID mitigation procedures and protocols, and so we should not have to reduce our bar hours, and if the government couldn't have a good reason or didn't have a good reason for imposing that, uh, then if they couldn't show that it was narrowly tailored and use the least restrictive means, then the bar owner, uh, in theory, would be able to operate until 2 a.m., just like state law otherwise would allow them to do. And again, if the court didn't rule within seven hours, or excuse me, seven days, then the bar owner or operator would get the relief uh, that they're asking for. In the context of the local health officer orders that applied to masks, a reduction in gatherings and operations and movement of people and religious gatherings. So if it was one of those five uh, categories, then that would allow you to, to file for an SB 40 hearing. And again, this isn't, this isn't really a novel concept in the sense that you get to have your day in court. We've all heard that phrase. We just want to have our day in court. But what was novel was that the legislature understood and appreciated the purpose of having SB 40 and the purpose of these procedural due process hearings. And they created this statutory mechanism to, to allow for that. And I'm sure a great interest to everyone is also in the context of SB 40. Um, SB 40 applied to schools and school boards. And so kind of a similar process to the local health officer regime if a school board or a school basically imposed certain types of restrictions on students or impose mask mandates, things like that, then a parent on behalf of their child could file for an SB 40 hearing in front of the board. If the board denied it, uh, then they could file for their hearing again in district court and similar to, but not identical, but similar to a local health officer regime, then it's up to the government to prove that what they were doing made sense uh, without getting too bogged down in the legal details. It's the government's, government's burden. And so uh, 
why was it important? It's important because it allowed people to come in to court and have their hearing and it allowed people to voice an opinion. And it also caused the government to really think through what they were doing. So instead of just painting with uh, you know, broad strokes, they would really be required to kind of think through their health orders, their masking policies, things like that. And, and that is very remarkable. I mean, SB 40 was uh, a remarkable piece of legislation in that it put the burden back on the government to, to prove what they were doing is correct. Um, and that doesn't happen very often. So uh, kudos to the legislature for kind of thinking through what needed to be done uh, during a pandemic. So uh, then kind of fast forward to, till maybe just a couple of weeks ago, there was, I'm sure everyone here has probably heard, there was a court ruling in Johnson County, Kansas, um, dealing with SB 40. And I can't get into a lot of the details of the court's ruling, primarily because of timing, but in essence, the court ruled that SB 40 was unconstitutional. And so th there's a lot of information in the court's opinion. I, Derek Schmidt, our attorney general has indicated he's going to appeal the, the court's decision. And I think the best thing that I can say about the court order is that the judge really said a couple of different things that SB 40 um, in his view, violated the due process rights of government and that it violated the separation of powers because uh, courts are, you know, separate branch from the legislature. And I, I would encourage everyone to read the court's opinion so they can see kind of the court's thoughts on SB 40. My opinion on SB 40 and what I'm hoping to convey to everyone is that it was a, and continues in my mind to be a very good piece of legislation in the sense that it gives people the, the opportunity to have their voice and have their day in court. Um, that is what is most important. That is kind of the takeaway of SB 40. And so with that, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer as many questions as I can. Absolutely. Uh Thank you, Sam. If you were expecting a post-game analysis from the Royals game or something like that and find yourself listening to a discussion about SB40, um, you were on a candidate briefing with the Kansas Policy Institute, and that was Sam McRoberts, our litigation director at our Kansas Justice Institute. Um, so hopefully you're in the right place. Um, we're going to do questions using the Q&A in the chat function. So right down here um, at the bottom of your screen, we've got a couple of questions that came in already, um, and then I'll field those and kick them out to Sam. So Sam, I think you answered this, but lest anybody have missed it, um, Ken asked, did the bill specifically provide for which kind of judge, a district judge, a magistrate, court judge, or did it allow for either or through that appeals process? So I, uh, I don't- The hearing process, excuse me. Sure. I, I, I don't recall if it said magistrate or not, but I think the way it phrased it was uh, in the district court where, like, let's use the example of the local health officer. Uh, you would need to file where the where that order had been issued. And so I think the presumption was that it was going to be a district court judge. OK, we had another question. SB 40 passed um, with overwhelming bipartisan majorities and was signed into law by Governor Kelly back in April, I believe, uh, is when it took effect. Um, and then pursuant to the court order, uh, or the opinion that Sam just mentioned, um, there's some, been some questions raised about it as well. Um, and then we've got another question here. Um, what was the court's so I assume this means the uh, the court ruling from last week. What was the court's alternative without SB 40 for an individual business owner? Um, and I will uh, do Sam the solid here and say he's not able to offer specific legal advice uh, to potential clients. Uh, so if that's what you want, um, 
uh, use that case submission page up top and that'll get that process started. But in the meantime, Sam, as a general proposition, what was the court's alternative without SB 40 for an individual business owner? So from my perspective, the court didn't really offer an alternative to SB 40. The court basically just made his ruling on what he thought about SB 40's constitutionality or lack thereof. And so, I mean, we, we have some very strong arguments, some persuasive arguments, and I think successful arguments for why certain um, restrictions by local health officers are not appropriate. And so um, even, even if SB 40 is declared unconstitutional, there are still um, arguments that business owners can make when trying to push back against government restrictions. Right, and then here's a, a, what I think is a good question, a fair question, certainly. Um, can I use SB 40 to appeal the fine the health department imposed for not storing food at a correct temperature in my restaurant or something. So I guess the real question there is, does SB 40 apply outside of um, what we'd call kind of pandemic emergency related stuff, or is it only providing for, um, you know, the current situation with, with COVID, the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I think, I think I should start off by saying, you know, that it's unclear kind of the status of SB 40 at this precise moment, given the court's ruling. So, I mean, taking that into consideration, you know, we don't exactly know uh, the status of, of SB 40 at the moment, but going back to when we're talking about the local health officer regime, there is a basically a specific provision within SB 40 that talks about and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna quote from it because it's gonna make it a little bit easier. And I should also add before I do this, the lawyer in me is, is I want to make sure I'm not answering a specific question specifically to you. Like James was saying, if you have a specific question, you can reach out to us through our case mission. But when we're talking about SB40, it says if a local health officer determines it is necessary to issue an order mandating the wearing of face masks, limiting the size of gatherings of individuals, curtailing the operation of business controlling the movement of the population of the county or limiting religious gatherings, the local health officer shall propose such an order to the Board of County Commissioners. So that's kind of the, the heart of the operating language. Uh, we've got one more question here uh, for Sam. You mentioned uh, briefly that Attorney General Schmidt has indicated that he plans to appeal. Um, if there's any uh, thoughts that you have specifically on that, uh, that would be helpful to share because we've gotten a couple of questions here about what comes next and yada, yada, yada. So anything um, along those lines would be great. But then generally speaking, for those of us who are blessedly not attorneys on this call, um, what does that appeals process look like? Just generally speaking, without specific to this. I mean, yeah. Well, so, so first, what are my general, what's my general opinion on an appeal? I, I would encourage um, General Schmidt to appeal. I, I think that there are really good reasons to appeal the courts, the trial court's order. I think that there are really good legal arguments that can be made in support of SB 40. I think the premise behind SB 40 is very solid. I think it's a, it's a great bill in the sense that it gives people the right to have a hearing. I think it's good and it's necessary for all the reasons I talked about at the beginning. Um, if you are operating a business and a local health officer reduces your hours of operation, you should be able to have a hearing, a meaningful hearing at a meaningful time in a meaningful place. And I think SB 40 allowed people that opportunity statutorily, which is different than constitutionally. And so I, I I think based upon the comments from General Schmidt, he's going to appeal. And so um, I think that there are strong arguments in favor of SB 40, and I'm sure Kansas Justice Institute will be looking at potential opportunities to, to file an amicus brief, things like that. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna ask you one more question because I think it gets to the, if memory serves, part of what the judge was ruling um, as well. So, 
um, Susan asked the question. So in, in essence, SB 40 bypasses local government due process, city council, county commissioners, et cetera. SB 40 is taking away the idea of local control and, contrading, and creating control for larger government. Um, any thoughts on that? Maybe the difference between, you know, do governments have due process? Do individuals have due process? Um, did SB 40, even as previously constructed uh, before the judge's ruling, um, or maybe initially constructed, if not previously, um, get rid of local government control? Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure I understand the premise of the question. And so let me just try to answer it this way. I, I think that SB 40's intent was to give people a voice. And so I don't think that that is bypassing local control. I don't think that's bypassing um, the government. I mean, this, this is the whole point of SB 40 is to be able to have your day in court. And so it is, it is a robust procedure and process to be able to push back against potentially arbitrary orders. And at the end of the day, if the government can justify some of their local health orders, then they can justify them. And then so be it, everybody moves on. But if you, that, that's the beauty of SB40 is it gives people the mechanism and the opportunity to have their day in court. All right, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, if you scroll back up to the top of the chat, function, you will see my email address. I'm James Franco with Kansas Policy Institute, Dave Trobert, uh, our CEO, uh, who will be batting cleanup for us. And then also the case submission page, which is the best way to get in touch um, with Sam. And then of course, if you uh, are tech savvy enough to have joined us for tonight, then presumably you can find us at all of the usual online watering holes and whatnot um, to reach out to us that way as well. So please do so. I apologize if we didn't get to get to everybody's questions all at the same uh, time on Sam's presentation on SB 40. Um, a couple of additional housekeeping things. Um, one, if you get in touch with us, uh, we can email you the uh, PowerPoint presentations that Dave and I are gonna be doing. Um, we talked briefly about uh, Sam not being able to offer specific legal advice during the Q and A, um, but reach out to him if you have uh, questions that case submission page again. And then given that this is a candidate briefing, um, KPI is a nonprofit organization. All the information is readily available on our website that we're gonna be going through tonight. It's published for anybody who wants it. Um, so reach out to us again. These are the same answers to questions that we would give to John Q. Citizen that we'd give to County Commissioner Smith, Governor Laura Kelly, Senator Masterson or anybody else who asked, it's nonpartisan is purely for uh, uh, nonpartisan analysis and research. So with that, again, my name is James. I'm the president of Kansas Policy Institute and I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about education uh, and what that means for local boards of education and the general public as well. I'm gonna share my screen. I am always surprised when this works as intended. So hopefully everybody can uh, see my screen right now. Dave or Sam uh, or Hannah on our team, uh, text me quickly if it's not working. Uh, but otherwise, I want to talk to you a little bit about education. And I'm going to be going through some of these slides very quickly just so that we get um, the opportunity to, to get through and still allow time for questions. But what we're really talking about here is an education system that gives kids a fighting chance. Not every kid is gonna be able uh, to succeed equally well in any given educational environment. Um, and my family is uh, a, a, a story in that in and of itself. Back in the 1970s, when it was time for my brothers to go to school, my parents moved across state line from Kansas City, Missouri, to what was then very rural Southern Johnson County. It's changed a little bit since then. Um, and it's because my family uh, had the opportunity to move to what they perceived as a better educational system. I'm a proud product of Kansas public schools. My mom taught her entire career in public schools and Kansas uh, special education classrooms. So none of this is to say that many kids in Kansas don't get a wonderful education. 
or that um, our teachers and our administrators um, and our custodians and everybody else involved with education doesn't do a wonderful job. It just means that there's no system that we should expect to serve the half a million public education kids we have in this uh, state equally well. And that's where the importance of local boards of education comes into play. So right here, uh, Kansas scores on the National Assessment for Educational Progress. And what this shows is that Kansas uh, ranks roughly um, in the middle of the pack across the nation when it comes to, excuse me, scores on the National Assessment for Educational Progress. Again, this sometimes flies in the face of what we hear typically about Kansas having a, a top 10 system or whatnot. But when you actually look into these scores, you'll see that our low income kids versus our not low income kids um, perform in the middle of the pack. Again, another metric. So it's not just the NAEP that's uh, showing uh, kind of middle of the road performance. It is also the ACT. So these are kids getting ready to enter college. And what we're seeing here in this instance, the ACT breaks it down by uh, race and ethnicity demographics. So you can see where we rank 33 for our white students, um, 34th for Hispanic students, and 33rd for African American. So again, it shows we are in the middle of the pack, but then look at that further column, the percent who are college ready. So only one in four roughly of white kids in Kansas are college ready when they are taking a college entrance exam. And then the numbers only go down from there. So again, are we happy with those kinds of numbers? And then here is the state assessment as well. We've got this data for every district uh, in the state. You can find it, we'll share some links here in just a half a second for some of this data. But Kansas Open Gov, uh, one of the sites we maintain, aggregates this. And with all that data uh, that I'm gonna be talking about and then Dave's gonna be talking about as well, we're pulling it directly from a governmental source. These are not KPIs numbers. Um, we serve as kind of a data aggregator in a lot of different ways. And this shows that even on the state assessment, this is 10th grade, how few kids are truly on track for college and career. And again, those are state numbers, state definitions. And if I say on track for college and career, I mean, that may mean something to us. Um, but if my kids bring home a grade card from school, if, they, if I see on track for college and career, I may get that. But what about grade level basic understanding, which is how the state assessment breaks down for some of those different definitions that you can see here. But if they bring home an A, B, C, D, or F, I know exactly what that means or have a pretty good idea for my own educational experience. And a couple of years ago, KPI started uh, doing our own scorecard for every building in the state of Kansas and seeing uh, how those schools were, were doing, excuse me. And what we did is just took KSDE categories and attached a letter grade to them. And on those scores, what you see is that no school got an A. Uh, and there are some private schools that are accredited in the state. So they also take the state assessment. And uh, in fairness, you'll see that no uh, private schools get an A as well. But you can see the breakdown there. And one of the things that was important from the uh, last um, kind of reauthorization at the federal level of the education uh, the U.S. Department of Education, is that it attached spending all the way down to the building level. So here you can see just first on the list, Wichita East, their letter grade on the state assessment was a C, and they spend roughly $10,307 per student on average uh, compared to some of the other state uh, schools here. And again, we have this for all 1,300 buildings in the state. There are a few exceptions because the populations are so small. But as a general proposition, if you go to that website up top, kansaspolicy.org slash A dash F, you can see this for every individual building in the state. And here's what we're really driving at, is that while we have been spending increasingly more on education, which is that green line on this chart here, what you're not seeing is a corresponding increase in student achievement, which are those blue and red lines down there at the bottom. So while spending is now $16,000 on average across the state of Kansas and far outpaces inflation, which is that orange line, what you see is pretty stagnant student performance. And education spending is a vital part of every education. You're not going to get anybody who tells you otherwise. But what we're essentially hoping for here is that the money we're investing 
is going to be driving achievement, which is what we want, is more opportunities for kids in Kansas classrooms. And we can drill down into individual districts um, and see how they're spending their money. There was a bill, a uh, provision of a larger bill that passed this year in the state legislature that certified that districts would have the money that they need to achieve their educational goals. So here you can see right here, the percent that this is for Blue Valley spends on instruction. And again, this is instruction is defined by the state uh, accounting manual and their budget is only 44% of their spending goes to instruction. Now, certainly some of these things also um, directly impact kids, but a lot of this stuff um, doesn't. And what we want to be seeing is that that money is being spent as close to the individual child as it possibly can be. And again, spending per student across the state. We have this for every district in the state um, at our different websites. Again, email me and I can get this to you for any individual uh, building on the A through F or for the districts themselves. And what we know, again, is that money does not simply drive achievement. It's an important part of it. But if money drove achievement, we would have seen that NAEP score continue to increase to go along with those spending increases themselves over the last 20 years. And just another way to think about that is on that NAEP test, so the National Assessment for Educational Progress, um, national standardized test given by the US Department of Education, it is the best way to compare across state lines and it is roughly considered the gold standard of educational testing. You can see all these different districts here um, scored the same NAEP composite score, but you can see the different spending that those, dis that those states got to kind of achieve that level of NAEP composite. So North Carolina spent 11,465, whereas Illinois spent over $9,400. And kids are not widgets. This is not the point of this slide to say that, you know, it's cost per NAEP point. But it, again, it is to drive home the idea that spending alone does not drive educational outcomes. So then the question is, what can we look to around the country where something has changed, where achievement increased? And the best example of this, and to our mind, is what's happened in uh, Florida over the last 20, 23 years, uh, starting in the late 90s, where they went on a pretty dramatic uh, change in how they structured education to where it was driven by choice and accountability. We'll talk about it more here in just a second. But you can see the difference between Kansas students from, 20, from 1998 to 2019, again on the NAEP, compared to what Florida's done. So Kansas has trended down just a touch, whereas Florida has significantly increased their achievement and has blown past Kansas. Same thing here for low income students. So these are the kids who are most at risk and most in need of uh, a hand up in life. And you see that same thing here as well. And here is the spending nugget of that as well. Kansas, 16,000. Uh, over $16,600 US average, you can see, and then Florida, just over $11,000. So something was different. And this is where you get into the documentary that we produced uh, and released just before the pandemic actually started, giving kids a fighting chance. So check that out on YouTube. Contact us if you want to host a screening of it around the state or have any questions about it. But you can check that out as well. If we had a little bit more time, I'd show you the trailer. Um, but giving kids a fighting chance, and it talks about what happened over those 20 years in Kansas compared to Florida. And again, it's in 1998, Kansas beat uh, Florida on six of the eight NAEP categories, and now they beat us on six of the NAEP, eight NAEP categories. So they have blown past us while we were arguing about how much we're spending in Kansas, they were actually changing something. And that secret sauce is it's about school choice. We have school choice in Kansas for the families that can afford it. We simply do not have it for the kids who cannot. Transparency, they actually put A through F grading into public law. So that way there is a clear metric whereby families, parents, communities know how their schools are doing. And they did accountability. They told uh, third graders who were coming up 
if you can't read by the time you leave third grade, you're uh, going to, to not be socially promoted. And that sounds harsh to a certain extent, but families could be promoted if they wanted to. But what it forced the schools to do was identify those kids in pre-K, in kindergarten, in first grade, and do the interventions then so that the kids were ready by the time they got to third grade. And they also incentivized different things that they wanted. They gave bonuses directly to teachers for kids who successfully passed the AP exam. And all of this boiled down to a tremendous amount of courage on the part of educators and administrators and elected officials to actually lead this charge. In Kansas, we have a tax credit scholarship program that was expanded this last legislative session. Education savings accounts were tied in the Senate and ultimately died um, after passing the House earlier this year. And there are a lot of myths that we could talk about. Uh, school choice has been upheld by the US uh, Supreme Court on multiple occasions. It drives accountability down to the parental level. And we haven't seen in other states the example of either private schools cherry picking kids or um, anything like that, or even actually um, it eroding the independence of private schools. And I'm going to quote here from Joy Aiken, who's a former Wichita school board member. In 2013, I staunchly opposed measures like this bill. I believed we could bring change from the inside and fix these issues for our most valuable students. But now I'm here today when she was testifying on a bill in the legislature this year, asking you to pass this bill because I got a good look at the inside of the system. And again, are these results acceptable? Are we okay with this level of achievement? And if not, what are we gonna do differently? There's a different way to look at the spending about how much of that is on instruction as a, as a total amount statewide. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of uh, school districts sitting on about $1 billion of operating reserves. So this is just like our checking account. Um, the green bar there on your screen is the one to look at. And we go from in 2005, less than a half a billion dollars to now a billion dollars in cash reserves that is money that taxpayers have given to schools but has not been spent. Employment, we're employing more and more teachers, or excuse me, more and more non-teachers. You can see that growth there, 49% growth compared to 17% of classroom teachers and 8% enrollment increases. And this is where we get into uh, a lot of the importance for local boards of education. These decisions are made by local boards. The state has a role, the federal government has a role, um, arguably an outsized one, um, but the importance is on local board members asking questions, demanding answers, really sinking their teeth into these questions about curriculum. 20 years ago, um, it was No Child Left Behind, then it was Common Core. Now we're hearing an awful lot about social emotional learning or critical race theory. And all, almost all of these decisions are in large part driven by local districts, including how we spend money on at-risk kids. So these are the kids defined by the state as being in the most need of help. These are uh, kids that come from the most economically challenging circumstances. And the uh, state's own bean counters, the Legislative Post Audit Committee uh, was quoted as saying at-risk funding was used for teachers and programs for all students and did not appear to specifically address at-risk students as required by law. So again, are we happy with the results that we're getting when we know that the money that taxpayers have spent is not being directed where it is intended, let alone where it is required by law? And we're seeing a lot of this different kind of stuff come up in the last 15 months of the pandemic, but it even predates that. It's almost just like uh, the pandemic kind of threw some of these things into even starker relief about where these decisions are being made and where the true focus is. Is it being focused on academics and individual children? And again, a lot of these decisions are driven by local boards of education. And that is the takeaway that I want you all to leave this evening from. And again, the state constitution says local boards and the state board are in charge of schools. And we've seen some of this tussle already start to take place over the last six or seven weeks um, with the legislature talking about a civics test uh, in order to graduate. So these battles uh, continue 
to, to percolate. But the question is, could we avoid some of these battles with more educational choice? If this is what we really had by way of choice for kids, because then you could find the right education that fits for your kid. I have three kids of my own and our oldest learns differently than our middle kid and both of them learn differently than our youngest. That's readily apparent with those three. But again, what about the 500,000 public school kids we have in Kansas public school classrooms around the state? Here again is our contact information. Uh, you can search for all of our recent articles, contact our office, and then there's that OpenGov website as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I see a couple of questions here um, that have already come in. So as I take a drink of water um, here, please do get me your questions. There's a question here about, does the state constitution limit our ability to change? Um, and I think the answer to that, the short answer is no, but it does present different kinds of challenges. So article six um, is the education article of this uh, state constitution. And a typical question that we get along these lines is what about charter schools? And in something like that, it really does present challenges in that charter schools are public schools. But the state constitution says uh, public schools shall be administered uh, or overseen. I'm Sam's the attorney. I'm not um, by a locally elected board of education. So it would be hard to see how a charter school, maybe that we have just across state line in Kansas City, Missouri, where they're doing great work um, to help individual kids and families, um, would be harder to see how that same kind of a charter school system would work here in Kansas. Um, so again, I'm stalling here for a half a second. If people have questions, please um, do so. We have another question here. A lot of kids don't want to go to college. I mentioned that as when it, you say on track for college and career, are you speaking to those kids? I think that is an excellent question. Um, that definition of on track for college and career is driven by um, the state. So that's their definition. And I think what they're trying to drive at is um, that they are on track for college or career. Now, whether or not that actually proof is in the pudding, I don't know. Um, but that's what they're trying to, to get to. There are some interesting things. Um, it's several years old now, but there's some cost sharing legislation so that if kids graduate from high school with a, uh, a certificate in a, in a skilled trade or something like that, um, there's some money that moves around to help incentivize that. So there are good things that are being done so that we don't just have this K through 12 system that only pushes kids to four year colleges. But I think, again, that is where you get to the idea of school of choice that allowing families and allowing kids to be able to find the right fit um, is a good way to do so, uh, to address that very same question. And then we've got time for one more. Um, there's actually two here. Is school choice something that can be addressed on the local level or does it need to come from the state level? And what does school choice look like locally? So um, part of that is some districts do have limited school choice. Um, Wichita has some magnet schools and things of that nature. Um, public schools are allowed to, it is up to the, under current law, the receiving district. If I live in um, Wichita, but want to send my kid to the Andover Public Schools, it's up to Andover to say, yes, you can send your kids there. Um, so that kind of thing does exist on a very, very limited level, but it is still controlled by um, the local school districts. And if that's something that a local board of education wanted to do, they'd be empowered to make lots of changes along those lines. Several years ago um, in Douglas County, Colorado, they provided for um, some pretty robust school choice uh, driven by their local district um, as well. And then several states in New England, actually, these are incredibly rural districts, probably not dissimilar from some of the rural districts in Kansas that have so few students that they just effectively say, we're not going to run our own school. We're going to give kids the money to go choose on their own, um, which would be very interesting to see that same kind of thing happen here in Kansas in a variety of different ways. But again, um, 
that gets us to the point of the importance of local boards of education. Uh, there's several questions here about emailing PowerPoints. Again, contact us. Um, and then I'm trying to keep track of the people who've made that specific request. So we will do that as well. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dave Trobert, KPI's uh, CEO. He is uh, one of those uh, bean counters uh, that I mentioned before, um, recovering at any rate as a, an accountant in a previous life, lectures widely around the state, testifies before the legislature on a variety of issues. And he's going to be talking to us about economic opportunity and what that means for fostering uh, economic growth and ultimately jobs um, and what local government can do to create that same thing. So, Dave, take it away. Thanks, James. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. We've had a, a lot of great questions tonight. We've had a lot of great questions when we did these uh, things live. I'm going to do the same thing uh, James did. I want to move around. Uh, I'm going to go through this presentation uh, a little quickly. I don't want to keep you folks here any longer than we need to. We'll get this. There we go. So uh, the first thing I, I want to start with is to help people understand that our cities and counties are not at all competitive. Uh, you know, the Tax Foundation recently said Kansas is the worst state in the nation for taxes on mature businesses. Uh, and part of that's because we have subsidies that uh, go to a, a few businesses. Kiplinger's says we're the fourth worst state for retirees. Uh, we have very high sales taxes, very high uh, effective property tax rates. This is an example. Uh, this is an annual uh, survey that's done by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Um, and it, what it's showing here is the same kind of property in different states. So for example, a, a rural commercial property worth a million dollars with $200,000 in fixtures pays $61,000 in property tax in Iola, Kansas, which to them, to Lincoln is the largest uh, rural area that fits their, their definition of rural. Whereas in other states like Utah, that same property only pays $15,000. In Tennessee, <clears throat> excuse me, it pays uh, less than thirteen thousand. Kansas, you know, so that that is the highest. Uh, Iola, Kansas, is shown as having the highest effective property tax rate on commercial property in rural areas. Uh, that is a really big barrier to growth. Uh, look at the homesteads. Uh, the one hundred and fifty thousand dollars house in Iola, which is kind of like most of rural Kansas is paying three times the property tax for the same house in Tennessee and Utah. The urban areas aren't as badly ranked, but Wichita has the 13th highest effective tax rate on uh, commercial property and the 28th highest on, on uh, residential. This slide shows you a picture of, of how property tax has grown over the years and we're measuring property tax in dollars here because that's how people pay their property tax. They pay with dollars, not mill rates. Uh, it's grown uh, more than three times inflation. Uh, we've had 11% population increase, 53% in inflation, but 167% increase in property tax overall. On the right side, you can see how each component, the state, the education uh, units, and local governments have grown, with local government being the worst of the three. This slide shows you, and we have this, by the way, on every county and all the large cities. This gives you a picture on a local basis of how this has changed. Uh, it's been a pretty steady progression up. In case of Overland Park, there's a 320% tax increase. While inflation was 53% and the uh, population was about 45, 46%. So it's 3.2 times the combination of inflation and population. But that's not even the worst one. Here's an example in Douglas County, almost a 400% property tax increase, 4.8 times inflation and population. Saline County, 5.8 times inflation and population. These are the pictures of an ever increasing tax burden on the people who still live and work in these counties and cities. 
And again, you can get all of this information at kansasopengov.org. If you click on the school section, you'll find a lot of what James showed you, the city and county, and we also have a lot of state information there. Uh, the good news about property tax is our new truth and taxation law will slow the growth over time. Uh, and the way that's working is this year, and we've already seen it, we're doing surveys of a lot of cities, counties, and school districts. Mill rates are automatically reduced by law. So the new valuations that come in this year will bring in the same dollar amount of property tax to the city, the county, or whatever the local unit is. And then they have to notify you if they intend to increase what's called the revenue neutral rate. They have to hold a hearing and vote on the increase. There's no limit on what they can do, but they just have to be honest now about the entire property tax increase they are uh, imposing. Uh, this legislation was modeled after Utah, which has had it in place over 30 years. And uh, over the last 20 years or so, Utah's effective property tax rate declined seven and a half percent, while in Kansas, it went up 22 percent. Now, I'm not going to go through all these. There were a lot of other property tax reforms passed this year, uh, about a half dozen on, on the appraisal process and more on the appeals process. It's a lot of great stuff there. If you want to get some more information, you can find it on our website or get in touch with us. Now let's talk a little bit about why we have high property taxes. Part of it's baked into our constitution where property, for example, commercial property is assessed at 25% of appraised value, but residential is only assessed at 11.5%. Kansas, as you'll see shortly, is massively overgoverned, and we also have cities and counties and school districts spending a lot more than necessary to provide good quality services. Uh, and speaking of property tax, uh, every city, county, school district is collecting a lot of money over the next 12 months from the uh, COVID stimulus plan, the, the most recent one. There was a, about a billion dollars last year. This year, cities and counties alone are going to get 1.1 billion. The state is getting 1.6 billion and schools are getting another 830 million. So uh, this is some great opportunity for citizens to uh, petition their government and say, how about sharing some of that with the people who really had a lot of uh, issues during COVID, a lot of losses, uh, and for candidates to maybe make some proposals that that's how that, be, uh, that money be used, at least some of it. Our, our 2021 Green Book, which is also on our website, is an annual publication we do that explores the relationship between the size of government and economic growth. It's packed with data. Uh, it's one of the most popular uh, things that we produce each year. And here's an example of what we mean by Kansas being massively overgoverned. We're the third worst in the nation for cities and counties and townships uh, on a residence per government basis. Uh, we have six times the number of those governments at, on a per capita basis. We're the second worst state uh, for local government employees per capita. And if, if we were just at the per capita average uh, for the nation, we'd have 38,000 fewer local government employees. And if you just do the math on that and assume say $50,000 all in for pay and benefits, that means we're paying about $1.9 billion in excess property tax or sales tax for those that, that charge it. Here's an example of something we did uh, looking at how counties spend. And this is comparing all 105 counties and we grouped them by population size and then looked at the low, median and high spend per resident. And you can see here at every level, there are two to three, sometimes four times as much per resident from the low end to the high end. So. You know, if you're at the high end of say uh, $1,134 per resident, uh, residents there ought to be asking, uh, well, what services are we getting for that, that the folks uh, spending $739 or less, what are we getting that they aren't getting? It's, it often comes down to, it's just how much a government chooses to spend uh, to provide those services. And there's a great way that some governments are really starting to, to take a hard look at to understand how to reduce those costs. It's called performance-based budgeting. 
And basically you start by prioritizing everything that unit of government does. And, and one of the reasons you do this is so that if you get into a recession and you have to cut spending, you wanna make sure you're cutting it from the lowest priority so that you're protecting your highest priorities. If you don't do this, I'll guarantee you money is being cut kind of across the board and hurting some of the most important things that a city or a county does. You wanna establish measurable goals and then you have to see, are we meeting those goals? Are we making progress toward them? Are we putting money where our, our priorities are? Uh, there's a, a lot of long discussion here we could have on building a performance-based budget. I'm gonna skip over that, but bottom line here, the goal is you wanna keep taxes low by operating efficiently and effectively. Now, I showed you earlier, uh, Overland Park had gone up uh, 320%. We did the math here to show just what this would mean if say Overland Park had been spending just at the increase of inflation and population. So you can see here, this, this is the real increase. Inflation and population would have been 100%. So instead of a 46% mill increase over that time, the mill rate would have declined 30%. And in 2020, Overland Park would have charged 52% less property tax. This is real money that can make a real difference in growing an economy and creating more job opportunity. Uh, some of the economic development issues we're facing um, uh, is, is partly from a lack of understanding of what drives uh, the Kansas economy and frankly, every economy in the country. Uh, we are excruciatingly uh, dependent on uh, jobs on small business and jobs from new establishments. And a new establishment could be uh, Sam opening a new restaurant or it could be uh, Walmart opening a new store with a new address. But without jobs created by these new establishment, Kansas wouldn't have had a single year of private sector job growth since 1984. Now think about that and compare what we're doing. How much of our economic development issues giving handouts and subsidies are going towards these new establishments. Most of them are trying to chase somebody, encourage someone to cross a state line. That's not what's driving our economy. Um, and, and so part of the reason that these uh, barriers uh, don't work, these stimulus issues, is Thomas Sowell's definition of scarcity. Um, you know, there's only so much of an, anything to go around. Basically, we all have a fixed amount of disposable income. And so when government does subsidies and tries to drive economic activity to a different part of the city, it's really just shifting it because we as consumers don't have any more money to spend. We're just spending it in different places. Um, the, uh, when, when government officials look at subsidy programs, uh, it's always measured in terms of a return on investment to the government not to the people, just to the government. And they never, I've never seen one at least, that has taken all of the information into account because any subsidy that is given to anyone is first coming out of your pocket. It's taxpayer money that is first taken out of the economy or eventually be taken out, and then it gets put back in. So you can't just forget about the first part and measure a return on, on investment, even if you measure it accurately, uh, and come up with any kind of a, a realistic result. Uh, you have to, instead of trying to do the same thing over and over again and, and hoping you get a different result, we really encourage people to diagnose and attack the root causes of issues. So we use affordable housing as, a, as an example. It's a hot topic. People are talking about it in urban areas and rural areas. But the proposed solutions never consider what those units of government are doing to make housing less affordable. Like how much is a property tax contributing to it? Think about how much property tax you pay as a percentage of your uh, mortgage. Uh, these are really big issues uh, that need to be taken into account. And while James talked about uh, education and local school board members have to deal with it, city and county officials should be dealing with it as well because 
you know, how can you earn a good living if you're not getting the education that you deserve? And so you really have to effectively advocate for change uh, as a local official and, and bring it down to supporting taxpayers, not the bureaucracy, not officials. We need government, but we need government to do what it's supposed to do for us and, and put taxpayers uh, in front of every decision. So uh, I'll stop there. And that is, again, you have our uh, contact info and there I stopped the share. All right, and as Dave is catching his breath here, um, if you've identified yourself as wanting the PowerPoint presentations, um, Hannah again, uh, the lady on our staff who makes everything click has noted that and she will be emailing it to you at the address where you registered for this event. So check that email address um, tomorrow morning for the PowerPoint presentations from both Dave and myself. And then if you scroll back up to the top of the chat bar, you can get Dave and I's email address also. Um, so again, I'm stalling here for a half a second. We're at the Q&A portion here. So if you've got a question for Dave talking about uh, property taxes, local governments and economic growth, uh, job creation at the local level, those types of things, um, let me know uh, in the chat function or in the question function. Um, Dave, a question that we often get about uh, property taxes and what was in SB 13 um, is that this is going to limit the ability for government to grow along with uh, real estate values or anything like that. Um, what say you did kind of that generalized critique about this is limiting uh, government, or maybe not even limiting, but um, like squashing the ability for local government to do uh, what they need to do to provide services? Well, I think that's a good question, James, but the, the people who ask that uh, presume that everything government is doing, whether it's a city, county, or school district, or even the state, um, is they're doing it as efficiently as possible. And we know that's not true. We looked at the per resident spending. Uh, the first thing they should be doing is going back and looking at how they can continue to uh, grow, uh, you know, provide the services, but do it more efficiently. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. It doesn't prevent anything uh, from, in fact, the, the truth in taxation doesn't prevent uh, local officials from raising property taxes through the roof. They just have to be honest about it. Okay, we've got a question here. Dave, uh, what is your opinion of, quote, special elections and allowing bonds to sunset? Okay, so this is a, uh, I think it's a school district question. Um, and what happens a lot of times is um, you'll get a, a notice in the mail from your school district saying, vote for this bond issue and it won't raise your property taxes. Uh, and, and what's happening there is they're timing these new issuances of debt so that, that it comes out when the, a previous one is expiring. And so I think this question is, why not just let them sunset and uh, let them retire and then come back and be honest about what this new bill is gonna cost. Another way of doing it is to uh, legislatively, I guess you'd have to mandate it because they're not gonna do it voluntarily, uh, is that every communication about this, there should have to be language that says, if you don't vote for this, here's how much your property taxes will go down, because that's what will happen. When a bond issue uh, is retired, they stopped collecting the property tax to pay off the debt. And so if they don't issue new, you're gonna get a property tax reduction. All right, we've got a question from Bruce. At the local level, our representatives will tell us that we need more money to fix roads. Great, but that money comes from us in multiple areas sales tax, property taxes, et cetera. How do we fight this way of thinking? That's a great question. And, and I'm gonna take it back to the performance-based budgeting. Uh, that's where uh, the, the, every unit of government, uh, frankly, every business, uh, and, and probably families are already doing a lot of this. They're identifying their top priorities and that's where they're putting their resources. If uh, the first question to ask is if there's not enough for something like a high priority of a road, what is the money being spent on? How could we spend 
do something less of, more efficiently and divert those savings to the more, uh, more important projects. All right, and then one last question. We got it a couple of different ways here. Um, we, uh, meaning Kansas businesses, I believe, and how this was summarized, can't find workers. Um, what can we, again, Kansas businesses do to drive uh, more people to apply, to find qualified workers and whatnot? I mean, you've got about 10 seconds to answer, Dave, before we wrap up, so go. Contact every legislator, every state senator, every uh, representative, the governor's office, and insist that they stop the $300 extra weekly unemployment benefit. We cannot have, it doesn't, it's not good for business. And frankly, it's not good long-term for uh, people to be pay, effectively paying them not to work. That has to stop. Well, and Dave, uh, just yesterday, I believe, it, what maybe this morning, actually, you published a piece about some jobs numbers um, as well. Do you have the uh, Cliff Notes version of that real quick as well? Yeah, uh, you wouldn't get this if you were uh, watch, reading uh, local media because honestly, there's with the Democrat in the governor's office, media has stopped reporting this, but Kansas lost 4,000 private sector jobs in the second quarter, but they added 8,500 government jobs. That's upside down. We can't have that. Why did we need to add uh, government jobs? At the pace we're going since January of this year, we're not going to get back to pre-pandemic levels until sometime in 2023. Uh, it just depends. But this is a really slow recovery. And a lot of it is from shooting ourselves in the foot at the government level. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Sam. And again, thank you to Hannah uh, and Ellen and Beth and everybody else on our team for making this event possible. Um, regardless of what you thought about what you heard tonight, hopefully it gave you something to think about in one way or another. Um, if you did not um, get your question answered, I apologize. You can go back up in the chat function, reach out to Dave, myself, or Sam, and we'll be able to hopefully get an answer to that quickly. If you said that you wanted the PowerPoint presentation, we will be sending it to you um, at the email address that you use to RSVP for this. Um, and forgive a, a sentimental note here at the end. Um, when Alexis de Tocqueville wrote his book uh, in the middle of the 19th century about America and what made us special, it was about local government. And it's not about what Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson are talking about. Um, tonight on Fox News or MSNBC or uh, Newsmax or whatever it is your particular choice. It is about these discussions and what is going on in our local governments and in our state. And we should not ever uh, think twice about how special that is. There was an article in the Hutch News that says uh, a few weeks ago that there is a record number of people running for local boards of education. And whether or not you agree with any of those people, whether those records are in your local district, um, that's something that we should all be applauding uh, because that's where those decisions should be made. Um, and we hope that those people running for those seats and others uh, feel a little bit better equipped to answer them for their local governments and their local boards of education after this evening. Again, thank you very, very much. Um, have a splendid uh, evening and uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us with any additional questions. Bye-bye.